Today's video is brought to you by Lovebook. Hey, brother. Guys, Hedwig, am I right? Like one of the most beloved characters in all of Harry Potter, like certainly my favorite bird. She's been his companion since the very beginning and she always remains Harry's like one magical connection to the wizarding world when he has to go and spend the summers at the Dursleys. She was the one who always allowed him to communicate with Sirius when he needed to and the one who was always there for him until she wasn't. No, no. <laughs> And the answer to the why is pretty well answered. JK Rowling herself has come out and said that the death of Hedwig is supposed to represent the death of Harry's innocence, which I think is true. I mean, Harry is always encountering life-threatening situations throughout the entirety of the series, and yet he still always cares about Quidditch and classes and going to Hogsmeade and has crushes on girls. But after Hedwig's death, that's not true anymore. Harry is all business. He has a mission and he is out to complete it. It. And I think that totally makes sense from a storytelling perspective. It's like showing us the audience symbolically that they are not a child anymore. They don't need their blanket or teddy bear. But, but I think there is another reason why Hedwig had to die. And I think I know specifically who killed her. Today, we discuss. Guys, before we dive on in, I wanna give a huge thank you to today's adorable sponsor, Lovebook. For about the cost of sending flowers, Lovebook might just be the gift of the year. It's a really awesome service that allows you to tell the story of your relationship with your best friend, significant other, family member, really just anyone. The service helps you make you and your special someone into a character in a beautifully printed hardback book that features all of your favorite memories. And it's really simple. All you do is build your little people or love emojis and go to work telling your story. Page by page, it can be how you met, your first date, your favorite memory together, holiday, vacation, that time they took care of you when you were sick anything. It makes for a beautiful gift that they are sure to remember. And if you want to get 20% off your entire order, you can do so by going to lovebookonline.com slash SCB. Again, that is lovebookonline.com slash SCB. Link is in the description down below. I hope you check it out. Okay, so Hedwig, our favorite beautiful snowy owl. The very first birthday present Harry has ever received, and it comes from one of Harry's all-time best friends, Hagrid, who, by the way, is totally a millionaire. <laughs> are super expensive and snowy owls aren't even native to Great Britain. Yeah, that's right. Hedwig is one of those few characters where JK Rowling herself has just come out and been like, yeah, I made a few mistakes. Although to be fair, like I don't really think it's that big of a deal that snowy owls aren't native to Great Britain. Like for example, my dog Indy, who actually sometimes I call Grindy because she has one blue eye, is an Australian shepherd. Well, yeah, but Australian shepherds aren't from Australia. Horse hockey. Yes, they are. <laughs> Pretty sure they're not. Australian Shepherds or Aussies were entirely developed in the United States to work on ranches. Their ancestors may have been Spanish herding dogs that originated in the Basque region of Spain. Well then, never mind. Where was I? Oh right, JK Rowling being wrong. Snowy owls? are actually mute. So like all of those little hoots of approval that Hedwig ever gave Harry, we need to go in with black Sharpie and omit all of those from all of our books whenever they happen. And any sense of positivity we ever got from any of those chirrups is just gone now. And, and Harry feeds her bacon once and owls don't eat bacon. So there. Anyway, Hagrid gives Harry an owl because he's rich. <laughs> And then Harry quickly scans through all of his new wizarding textbooks, finds the name Hedwig, and voila, we have our little silent, non-indigenous vegan owl. Actually, Hedwig isn't even that little. Like, snowy owls have a wingspan of like five feet. You have got to be kidding me. Where did you even come from? I've just been down here the whole time. The whole time. Either way, her ultimate untimely death is completely heartbreaking. Like she had so much more life to live. Well, 
Oh my god, how could that possibly not be true? She was a saint, Jay. A saint. Well, then, these giant, heavy, vegan mute birds actually only have lifespans of, like, ten years, and at that point, Harry would have had her for seven, and it's not like Hagrid bought her as, like, a little chick or anything, so I'm gonna go back down here. Okay. Maybe she didn't have that much longer to live, but at the very least, she is actually a saint. Or, at the very least, named after one. Yeah. Hedwig is actually named after Saint Hedwig, the patron saint of, wait for it, orphans. Because his parents are dead. That joke will never get old. Just like Hedwig. Dude, too soon! As much as I do love Hedwig, though, one thing that always kind of bothered me a little bit is the fact that she was always able to just go find Sirius wherever he was, even without an address, when, like, the entire Ministry of Magic couldn't track him down. Did seriously no one think to just address an envelope to him, send it with an owl, and then follow the owl? In fact, why do they even bother with addressing the envelopes anyway, and like, so ridiculously specifically? Whenever Harry sends a letter, ever, he always just tells Hedwig who it's going to, straps it to her leg, and she's off. Obviously, this particular issue has raised some questions over the years, and as a result, J.K. Rowling has actually offered some input. Although, while that clears up some things, it also leaves a bunch of other things completely unanswered. According to Pottermore, whether because they possess an innate bent for magic, just as pigs are reputed to be innately non-magical, or because generations of their ancestors have been domesticated and trained by wizards, and they have inherited the traits that make this easy, owls learn very quickly and seem to thrive off their task of tracing and tracking the witch or wizard for whom their letters are intended. Wait. Pigs aren't magical? Isn't the school where the kids learn stuff called Hog warts. Aren't hogs pigs? <laughs> Sounds to me like they're attending a school called non-magical warts. Ugh. Anyway, back to owls. Basically what that sounds like is that somehow, magically, owls are just innately able to understand the mysterious connection between a person, their name, and their geographic location on Earth. Basically a massive invasion of privacy. You know how like people are like worried about drones spying on them? Imagine that they're just biological creatures and they innately know where you are. You're not looking quite so cute anymore. This means they definitely do not need an address in order to deliver the mail. The address is kind of just a formality in the event that the letter somehow doesn't quite make it to its final destination and a human has to finish the job. What this fails to answer though is why the ministry never considered just writing Sirius Black a letter and following the owl right to him. And to that end, Voldemort? I feel like I could think of a really, really, really easy way for you to find Harry during the Deathly Hallows. Dear Harry, it's me, Voldemort. As you are reading this, I am bearing down on your exact location, having simply instructed this owl to find you. It was so easy, especially since I can fly. Did you know I can fly? Because I can. There's really nothing like the feeling of autumn air whipping past your flat nose holes on a crisp morning. Anyway, speaking of nose holes, I hope you enjoyed breathing. You are about to die. With such a built-in risk factor, you wouldn't exactly think wizards would rely on them for messages so much. When there are just other ways that you could communicate, like simply apparate to the person, or for that matter, flu powder to the person. Now, I agree, that might be like a little bit intrusive to just, you know, show up on somebody's fireplace. Or what about those coins that Hermione makes for the DA? Those are basically texting. Or, or the Patronus thing that Kingsley does with his voice. I know that they say Patronuses are like super hard to do, but I have a feeling part of that comes down to the fact that their only real use is like combating Dementors. Hey kid, want to learn this super complicated thing that will almost never come in handy? No. You can use it to text your friends. You mean I can magically message my friends without the need for an expensive owl that can track my location? Expecto Patronum! Guaranteed, those kids would figure it out instantly. There'd be like snap, pats and instatronuses all over that school in a heartbeat. Anyway, I feel like we've gotten a little bit off track here. Back to owls and specifically Hedwig and her untimely death and who done it. The death of Hedwig happens during the Battle of Seven Potters where there are actually seven different Harrys all in the air at the same time. And you might think that we can narrow in on the Death Eaters that specifically followed Harry and Hagrid, but it actually happens right as they get into the air. Meaning that there could be as many as 30 according to the narrator's 
assessment of how many Death Eaters were there, candidates for who could have killed Hedwig. And it's always kind of seemed to me like it was just pure chaos and we would never have any idea. Spells were just flying everywhere and Hedwig's death is just collateral damage. But I think the fact that it happens immediately, the first thing that happens points to one man in particular, Severus Snape. Now here's the case which is simultaneously for and against Snape. Of all of the 30 Death Eaters that are up there, Snape is the only one that has all of the information. He's the only one who actually knows there are going to be seven Potters. Because if you remember, that idea actually originally comes from Dumbledore who tells Snape to confund Mundungus to deliver that idea to the Order. Meaning he is the only person up there who would be immediately looking for some kind of key identifying factor as to which Harry was the real Harry. And he also happens to be the only one up there who isn't attempting to actively kill Harry and wants to make sure he gets out alive. So fortunately for him and unfortunately for Harry, Hedwig, Hagrid almost immediately turns the bike over, exposing Hedwig, thus immediately identifying, at least to Snape, which of the Harrys is the real Harry. Hedwig, as we have spent most of this video explaining, is a particularly unique owl for Harry to own, and therefore a dead giveaway. In this case, quite literally, a dead giveaway. Too soon, Ben. Too soon. But Harry can always identify her as the lone white owl during mail time, and even Lavender Brown kind of exclaims that she's always loved that one specific owl. On top of that, the Death Eaters have clearly been briefed on what might be identifying characteristics about Harry himself, because as we know, later in that same battle, he is in fact identified for using his signature spell, Expelliarmus. So I think Snape was on the lookout for any clue as to what might give away the real Harry, and as soon as he saw Hedwig, he had to kill her to protect Harry. And not just then, but also in all of Harry's journeys still yet to come, which of course Snape also knows about. To me, this is the exact kind of severe protection that I would expect Snape to use for Harry. It's just another reason to love him and hate him. As always. Guys, for my question of the day, what do you think? Did Snape kill Hedwig? Be sure to leave your thoughts in the towel section down below. And if you'd like to see some more Snape content from us, you can check out our J versus Ben on him right here, or you can check out how Luna is actually Snape right here. But Jay, that's all I've got for you today, man. I will see you on Tuesday.